This discussion with Michael J. Feldman of the law firm Olender Feldman took place during a tea equipment webinar held on June 16th, 2020. Michael is a data privacy lawyer, so he has broad knowledge of data usage rights and regulations under the law. In this discussion, Michael goes into detail on the legal requirements that businesses must comply with when performing temperature screening of employees and customers. Please note that this discussion is for general informational purposes only and is not intended to constitute legal advice. Okay, so uh, before I go into some of these issues here, I just want to kind of hit a few key issues or parts because a lot of this is new it's evolving um, a lot of it contradicts itself as you'll see and, but at the same time a lot of the issues that arise here or potential issues that arise here with temperature screening are pretty standard in the privacy data privacy protection world um, so i want to go over a, a few basic things first i always start with the premise that the less data the less information you collect, the better. Now that's that's typically contrary to the business practices. Old school business practice would be collect everything, store everything, and that's that. With data breaches, um, and data breaches being both intentional and unintentional, we're not just talking about hacks, we're talking about mistakes made internally. With, with data breaches increasing, the more data you have, the more harmful. Now we'll get into how that impacts use of temperature screening, which I, I do think is a good idea using temperature screening, but we'll get into the impact of the less data you have, the better. That being said, all of your uses, just like all of the, the uh, various devices everyone over, are based upon really fact-specific scenarios. The size of your, the physical size of the facility that you're at impacts things. The number of employees or the number of people you're screening makes an impact whether you're using trained medical professionals or an employee makes a difference. The device you have makes a difference. Some of you may already have a device. So for you, it's a matter of setting up your office, your facility to match that device and the issues that arise based upon that device. And some of you maybe are considering buying one of these devices and in that case, your choice of which device can't just be based upon you know the features this one looks cool this one's faster this one's whatever it's going to to make the best decision um, from both a legal and practical uh, view you're going to want to consider the purpose for which you're obtaining it again two employees I'm, I, for example i work um, pre-coronavirus now i'm working remotely but pre-coronavirus most of the time I'm working in my office and my office is a freestanding building. We are the only people that work there and the we are probably 30 people, give or take. And we're 30 people on multiple floors in a unique setup. So our office, if we were doing temperature screening, might be very different than someone who's in a standard high rise with a lobby, which might be very different from somebody where there is no lobby or the lobby you have to go in the elevator, go upstairs and pop out, and now you're in the lobby. Um, it may make a difference if you normally use or you expect to use your lobby or waiting area for customers, and maybe you need to be creative or maybe you have a particular device that handles it better. So those types of factual specific scenarios arise. Then you have what I'll call a few battles going on here. And I use the word battle because my kids call everything a battle whether it's a sports uh, game or otherwise. So you have the battle of protecting everybody from, in this case, people are looking at coronavirus, but it could just as well be the flu or anything else. Generally, when you have a temperature, it tells you something, a high temperature, it tells you something is wrong. And oftentimes that wrong is some sort of infection or something that's contagious. So you have this desire to protect everybody. And that is also, deals with OSHA regulations that we'll get to versus um, wanting to avoid any liability for your business from violating people's privacy rights. I use that term broadly, but you know, you, you have that 
conflict going on. That's where HIPAA comes in, kind of almost HIPAA versus OSHA, for example. You have the battle of trying to get the perfect temperature, and Evan was going over examples of um, whether it's FDA regulations or best practices, how to best take a temperature, how to get the most accurate reading versus social distancing, where obviously you don't want to create a scenario where to get the perfect temperature, you tell everyone to come in the lobby, take their jacket off, take their masks off, and stand all together for 10 minutes while you're waiting to take their temperature. Uh, that would be a very counterproductive scenario there. And then you have the added battle of the potential of whether you need to pay your employees, certain employees, um, for their waiting time, which becomes not so much an issue if it takes them two minutes to get into work versus a scenario where maybe you're making them wait for a half hour. And that may come into, for your particular office, a faster device if you have that. And paying a little extra perhaps for a faster device may be money saved if it saves you from paying employees to wait in the lobby. Um, which leads to you really need to know the device. And Evan was mentioning it. And I would have to agree. You want you want to be able to call, contact somebody and say, what data are we getting? How does this work? What are the variations in temperatures? All that kind of information that you want to know so you can make the device match your needs. And the final just general thing I would add is you want to be very clear with your employees or whoever you're using it for. You may be a landlord, so they're not your employees, or it may be your employees, or you might be using it for a restaurant, so call them what you want. You want to be very clear with them with what you are doing and what you're not doing. For example, are you storing the data or not? You want to be clear that you're not testing them for any disease. And if there is what I'll use now, the term positive, the red light goes on or negative, I suppose, the red light goes on. It's not, you're not telling them they have coronavirus. You're not telling them they have anything. You are simply making a determination or the device made a determination that they have a temperature and you wanna have a policy and be clear with it. You also want people to know that you're not providing any medical advice. You, if somebody tests, has a temperature here, Standard tends to be 100.4, but that may vary. And as Evan mentioned, if it's a hot day, people may be, and people need to walk from their car or work, walk from public transportation to get in, the average temperature may be higher. So, but using one, you know, 100.4 as a baseline, as an example, you want to let people know that you testing them and you making a determination ultimately, hey, you can't come in, which would be after a second screening, but you can't come into the office today you need to let them know that it's up to them to figure out, to go to a doctor, to see a medical professional, to make a determination as to whether they are sick, whether it's coronavirus or otherwise. So it may seem obvious, but you wanna have all this in policies and procedures and you wanna let people know what that is. So, and, and now that I've got through that, what, I'm, what I wanna do now, I'm gonna just real quickly go through these bullet points here and then open it up to more specific questions because I could go on in detail about these bullet points for the next day um, and for all of you and I might not answer your questions. So I'm going to hit these kind of real quickly. So the privacy concerns when your employee has an elevated temperature, that's kind of the battle with the first one I talked about. You want to come up with a way to make a determination as to whether it's safe or not from a health perspective to allow this employee or allow this person to come in. At the same time, you wanna take all action that you can, that's practicable, to not let others know. Um, and that may be easy, that may be hard. If you have five employees and one person gets pulled aside and can't come in, everyone's gonna know they had a high temperature. Um, if you are, if you have a huge group, you got hundreds of people coming in, they may not know. Um, so you want to take, you want to have a policy procedures to take what steps you can to protect that privacy. Um, and that comes into not letting people know at the moment and how you store the data, whether it's stored electronically, whether it's stored manually, whether you 
record Bob Smith and his temperature 102.7 at 9 a.m. on Tuesday the 5th, or you simply have Bob and red light, you know, red, and you don't keep that data. That goes back to the issue of the less data you have, the better from a privacy perspective at the same point, you wouldn't want to have a record of the fact that you sent Bob home because he had a high temperature, if that's in fact what you're doing. Um, that goes into the next, can you store or retain temperature results and is such storage regulated by law? If you take someone's temperature and you are recording their name and their body temperature and you're storing it electronically, that's generally going to be considered healthcare information and it's going to be regulated by HIPAA. If you store it manually, you write it down on a piece of paper, HIPAA doesn't really kick in. There may also be separate um, state laws, so you need to consider where you are, laws and regulations that govern storing healthcare data and what counts as healthcare data, which means at a minimum, as a general matter, you're going to want to have real training and real policies for the individual or individuals who are responsible for giving the test and getting the data. So there's the technical part, make sure you use the device correctly, you're recording it correctly, you're doing everything you should be doing from a technical viewpoint, and then procedurally what that person does with the data when they get it. Can um, I, uh, Mike, Michael, can I ask a quick question here? Is there a difference on absolutely. storing that, that data um, electronically and writing it down? Is there different uh, different laws or different guidance that, that, that applies to? Yes, well, generally, with HIPAA, you're dealing with storage and transmission of electronic data. So it can make a technical difference if you take the data and you write it down. Let's say you walk through Evan and I record, I write down on a piece of paper, uh, Evan Sorelli 102.4, and the electronic version of that data that's on the device is now gone. And I can't speak to the technical aspect how to do it. That's why people should uh, contact you guys. But you delete it. There's no electronic data now that you're storing. And if you can set up the device to never store it in the first place, you know, all the better. But now I have a record, and I would want to have a procedure that says what I'm doing. So um, kind of like police breathalyzers run their tests to show that they ran the test to show that it works. So yeah, if I wrote down Evan Sorelli temperature or Evan Sorelli positive, something to that effect, and that's it, um, it's going to have a different legal sure. implication. Now, will it make a difference if the if we don't store the temperature, we just store the result, meaning that this person had a potential elevated body temperature? Um, some units have the ability to turn off that temperature feature so they can store a, a result, but not actually the temperature. Does that make a difference? So it makes a difference in that you're having less data. Um, so in that sense, it's positive from a privacy perspective, but at the same time, since you would need to have a policy that let's say the red means over 100.4, um, if you connect it with the name and store it, you're still potentially storing medical data. And I say potentially because with respect to the application of HIPAA, it's somewhat evolving in how this plays out because sure, you have the sure. competing you have the competing legal schemes here because you do have an obligation. You know, talking privacy, you also have an obligation under OSHA to have a safe work environment. So and, we have two questions around that. I'm just gonna sure. Uh, we yep. have a lot of questions around HIPAA and, and th th this customer. And I don't know if we have a direct answer, but doesn't HIPAA apply to patient? Uh, provider relationship only? If so, an employer took a temperature, is it not HIPAA, but it's covered through the PHI, which is protected health information? Well, um, it's, it, it depends, again, on the, first it depends on the scenario, which is why to minimize any potential implications of HIPAA, you want to be clear that you're not providing any medical advice. Um, because you, you're doing, you, by taking someone's temperature, you're doing something that typically is medical in nature. So you wanna be clear that you're not. And the storage of the information, um, one, depending on the situation, HIPAA might or might not be involved. 
but it, it would be considered PHI, you're correct, which is why, for example, you wouldn't want to keep the results, whether it's um, Evan Sorelli and a red light or Evan Sorelli and a temperature in your personnel file. You would want to keep it separate from the personnel file because it's not the type of information that everybody can see. It's more of the nature of somebody comes to you and says, I have a medical condition, I need an accommodation. And you would want not want to store that, for example, in their uh, personnel file. Sure, we, we have, I'm just gonna give you a couple more questions because they seem very sure. pertinent. How do privacy laws uh, apply to visitors and customers versus employees? It's really, it's really the same. Um, you know, there's there there are slight differences in that you might be able to impose certain obligations by way of consent on a customer, like hey, you can't come in unless you consent, unless you give me consent to do this screening because that's considered as a general matter equal bargaining power. There are times when you impose certain obligations on employees um, that those obligations sometimes are unenforceable because there was not equal bargaining power. In this scenario, though, with taking temperatures, the law seems to be along the lines of you can force employees to have their temperature taken as a condition to go to work as long as it's done in a fair manner in equal policy, you know, you can't say just women need it or just people over 60 need it. Um, and the consequences of not passing, I'm using the generic word pass, but the consequences of not passing would all have to be even. So as a practical matter, you can impose it on everybody. It just has to be done fairly. That isn't to say that in the future that might not change where you're using this now and coronavirus is no longer an epidemic. It's just the flu. Understood. So, do employees need to be punched in before screening, or, or uh, let's say, or paid? Uh, so, for so the that itself? that's an excellent question. It's a common question, and it's a developing answer. And it first, it may vary state to state. Um, there are certain employees who are paid hourly and entitled to be paid hourly. There are others, you know, for example, it, I'll use my law firm as an example. There's no scenario where I would have to pay a lawyer to wait, but a, a secretary or a receptionist, if they had you know, your standard 40 hour work week and they were waiting in theory, that could very well count as their time because I'm making them do it, which was why um, I think I had mentioned earlier, if you have five people and you're gonna have them wait 30 seconds or a minute, I don't think there's any law that's going to say or any court that's going to say you need to pay them for that one minute. It's no different than taking off your jacket or going through quick security. If on the other hand, you're having people wait 20 minutes um, at the front end, there's a, definitely a, a chance that you may have to start that clock 20 minutes earlier. Whether they punch in, um, you have to deal with your scenario, whether physically you need to get them in and then take their temperature or you take their temperature and then they get in, but you give them credit for the time. Um, that becomes very fact specific and it becomes state specific, but that's where you might want to consider if it's 20 minutes on device A, which is a thousand dollars, but if you get device B, which is two thousand dollars, but takes two minutes, you maybe better off financially getting device B, spending a little more up front, but not paying your employees to all wait in line. Sure, and I think I'll let you finish the questions on the screen we probably have about 20 more waiting. If everyone's okay, whoever wants to continue, uh, we can go a few minutes late um, and continue to uh, get some of these questions out, if that works. Sure, yeah, and I'll, I'll be, this will take me two minutes to get through these last two, and then I'm yep. glad to answer questions. So the next one, because we answered, do you have to pay your employees to wait? Um, FDA recommendations on scanning effectiveness for CDC guidelines and social distancing. Um, that's one of the things I had mentioned towards the front. That's going to be customized to your particular scenario. You do not want to create a scenario where you're making the temperature scanning an unsafe scenario for your employees. That's just a bad thing to do for so many reasons. Um, and the list would go on and on. 
So you want to create a scenario which allows for social distancing. You want to obviously develop your company policy, which we do, but you may do internally, um, develop your company policy on wearing a mask and on social distancing, which is going to vary based upon, again, your office. You come into a narrow corridor um, that doesn't have good ventilation, you're probably going to want a higher degree of social distancing than being outside, which is going to require less social distancing than being in a grand lobby entranceway with 30 foot ceilings and great ventilation. So you definitely need to consider that. Um, and that goes into working both with whether it's your lawyer or your business person and someone like Evan who's selling you this to come up with the best equipment for your particular scenario. Because I could come up with a hundred different physical scenarios that would play out differently on social distancing. But you obviously don't want to do so have the social distancing in a manner that makes the device useless. Makes sense. So, and did, did uh, GDPR, as well okay. so yeah, GDPR, I'm going, all I'll say is GDPR, which is the law that governs privacy in most of Europe, um, in the EU, it, they're total different guidelines. It's far more strict on personal data, on getting consent and everything else. That being said, it only applies if you are collecting personal data of EU data subjects. So if your office is in the US, even if you have a customer and employee flying in from the UK, um, which is still going to be part of GDPR despite leaving the EU, like you're okay, you don't need to worry about it. If you have offices in Germany and you're considering this, you're going to have a whole host of different considerations that, um, you know, you talk to me or talk to someone who understands that a little better. I don't want to bore everybody else with that topic because that's pretty, that's 100% yep. distinct to the EU. So I'll go For back sure. to if you have some questions or issues. Yeah, concern. sure. Uh, there's there's a lot. Um, do visitors uh, have to be made aware of their temperature being taken? Can this be a lawsuit if they're not aware? Um, can it be a lawsuit? I, was that the second part? Yes. Uh, well, anything can be a lawsuit. Sure. So I'll, I'll go to the first part. Um, it will likely be state specific whether you need to make them aware, but as a practice, if you ask me, I'm going to say you always want to make people aware of what you're doing when you're scanning them. You want to have it written. You don't need to necessarily have this announcement and tell each person, but you want to have a policy and you want to have it written. So, yeah, I recommend you let them know, particularly if you're going to take some action based upon it. If you are, however, let's say instead of taking action specifically based upon it, you have a you want to point one of these devices at a crowd outside a line of customers who are waiting to come in um, and based upon that if you see somebody who's high you want to then pull them aside to take their temperature and you know you may be able to develop a policy around that where in the first instance of scanning people because say it also picks up people walking down the street you're uh you know you're in manhattan and you have a store and it catches people walking by you're not you're not gonna have to tell people walking by that you're scanning for temperature so in that scenario the answer would be no when you're taking action based upon it the answer would be yes um I, and the the difference is i kind of view it as that you have a security camera think of it that way outside your place that's picking up everybody who's walking by. You don't need to tell everybody that you're recording them walking by, but when you do something with that data, you may have an obligation. Yeah. So again, it's gonna be pretty fact specific. Uh, one question is, can't we de-identify the data and rely on the physical access controls? So some customers, um, so there's usually a visual and thermal image and the optional uh, part is whether you display that temperature or not. Can you take the you know the actual image away and just store a thermal image or some part of it taking away the identity of what data that is? Well, I guess the, the question would be back to what end. Maybe I need to understand that a little more. 
Um, Cause somehow you're gonna have to connect, I assume the data to a person, right? Uh, yeah, well, there's some customers that just want to store the, the fact that they have a positive, uh, like a, a potential elevated body temperature, but they don't necessarily need to store the actual image itself. So it's oh, just I... proof that they're doing the screening and their due diligence and they're trying to lower their overall risk, you know, that, that and they've done something. So there's proof that the screening occurred and they found these X results. So the answer is yes. Not only can you do it, you should do it. I think that's a better process than keeping the all the details of the result because you're not the doctor. You don't need their exact temperature. Um, that being said, you want to have a procedure and a, or a policy in place that says this is what we're doing. So you want to you're going to have a record because if this person says, "Hey, you made me go home. I didn't have a temperature. That's not fair." You want to have a policy. Here's what we do. We do this, we do this, we do this. And if somebody has a temperature over 100.4, we write their name in the book together with, you know, we download proof from the device that records it as red. And then that's what yeah. you actually do. Then I assume you you write those policies, you, you, you and your yeah. firm. Yeah, and the policy is going to be fact specific to your scenario. But yeah, we write them. Yep. We help you. Sure. Understood. Should all employees sign a waiver when using the cameras? Um, it, you don't need them to do so. Um, it raises the issue, as I had mentioned before, about um, you know whether there's equal bargaining power, whether the waiver would be effective. Um, so while it's not necessarily harmful to do it, you would have to realize it may not be enforceable. But what I think is a better practice to have employees sign is acknowledgement of your of what you are doing, the reason why, and what you're doing with the data, which we had talked about. You know, that's you could do in the first instance, kind of the same thing you might do with an employee handbook and have them acknowledge receipt of the handbook. This is almost becomes an addendum if you have an employee handbook almost becomes an addendum to the employee handbook um, that they're acknowledging. To me, that carries more weight and is a better process than just having a, a waiver that says, you allow us to do this and we can do whatever we want with the data. Understood. I think and the same, the, same, the same might apply to customers, by the way. You know, there may be, there's gonna be scenarios where you're not gonna do it, it doesn't make sense for the person walking in your store to sign anything, but it may make scenario, it may make a difference if you have somebody who's, you know, a customer that's going to be on site for three weeks in a row. Makes sense. All right. Um, we have a, uh, so here, here's a common one is displaying. So we have, there's a lot of systems on the market that will actually display data um as you're walking in um it'll you'll see yourself on the screen and you'll see your temperature or you'll see yourself in either a go or not go fashion they feed the data back to the people coming through either for a self uh self-service system where it's showing to the data but it's showing you whether you pass or fail is that allowed they're saying, is, is that a HIPAA violation or the, the other act that you were talking about, displaying the actual result or the temperature? So, so I don't think you really are going to have a concern with the individual seeing their own information. Um, what, what if you, someone's behind them? You, right, you run into issues where the person behind sees your information. Obviously, the more you show, the more the concern is. Um, which may be the device itself. It may be if you're showing a temper, the actual temperature versus a red or green light. Um, which, you know, my recommendation as an attorney is you minimize the ability of others to see whether it's the shape of the line, whether it's the angle that the device is turned. Now, that may be impossible. You may need to just do your best with it. And the reality of this scenario is. If it's a red light, as you had mentioned, the practice should be you're basically pulling the person to aside and taking their temperature with one of these other more targeted devices. 
And if you if you're in line and you see someone get pulled to the side, you're going to assume something popped up, kind of like going through airline security. The person that gets pulled to the side where they want to pat them down or whatever, you suspect something popped up. So it, you can only do what you can do, but you want to make your best effort to minimize other people seeing a person's temperature. Yep. And I'll, I'll end on this question. Uh, this might be one, one you know or don't know here, and then probably have a, a lot, as many as we can get to after the presentation, we'll be in, emailing some responses. But um, can you speak to the Biometric Information Privacy Act that I think it's Illinois, Washington, Texas? Illinois. Yeah. yeah. And how it relates to temperature screening. They have a factory in Illinois. Sure. So as a general matter, these devices, from my knowledge, and you'd have to, you could probably speak better to this than me, but the devices that have facial recognition aren't recognizing characteristics about your face and matching it to you. It's simply using technology to identify where your face is. So then it can take your temperature on your face as opposed to your arm or the balloon you're holding next, you know, that's floating next to your head. So to the extent that's all the device is doing and it's not identifying, you know, so it can't tell me from you and it's not storing data of me versus yeah. you, the biometric laws should not really come into play. To the extent it both. is. There are both. There are some units that have the ability to, again, a lot of this you could just turn off if you don't want to use it. Right. So to the, the, to to the load extent. In and, yeah. So to the extent it is, and I think you may have mentioned some of these devices that can, can maybe compare people day to day to see, you know, relativity. I may always be low, I may always be high. To the extent the device is, is first of all, is recording an image of my face. That arguably is biometric data that's being retained. So that goes into the storage of it versus the identity. But to the extent the device can identify that as Michael Feldman coming into the office, yeah, that's going to implicate the biometric laws. And it doesn't mean you can't use it. You may need consent and you may need to store it certain ways. And I don't know the technology of these devices, you know, the ability to store it in yeah. you know, hash. So it's not, you're not storing the biometric data. So it, it that kind of divides whether it is or is not implicated. And then, of course, you need to be in those states to have it be an issue. Yes, and then the unit we talked about with the AI that does the compensation, that's just, it's its averaging different temperatures. It's not recording. It's not even um, storing who it is or different people. It's just uh, identifying a baseline temperature. Other units um, have the ability to almost sign in and out, you know, almost like it recognizes who you are, sign in through like a kiosk system, like for punching into your system, doing integration, or have an image database that, it will recognize who you are and your result. Um, and a lot of the some of the systems that have that, we just say, hey, if you don't want to use it, don't use that particular function. Um, and when you talk about uh, the biometrics and identifying people, um, um, we refer to someone like yourself to kind of have that policy in a particular state. Um, do you have another five minutes or do you want to end it here? Yeah, I, if you have more questions, I, I can go five more minutes, sure. Uh, sure. Um, Well, while you're, while you're pulling up the next question, I will mention one thing. Um, you want to, as the company or business giving the test, you want to make sure that not only are you providing a safe environment for the people who are getting tested, you want to make sure you're providing a safe environment for your employee or agent who's doing the test. So just keep that in mind as well, whether it's masks or otherwise. The person who's giving the test, remember, if you have 100 people coming in, the person giving the test is exposed to 100 people walking by, whereas the person getting tested is only exposed to, say, one person, the person doing the test. Yeah. So the, what is proper protection may vary on the scenario. So just be aware yeah. of that. So I have a question. My building landlord is screening people before they entered our a shared building. Do I have any obligations to my employees, customers that are scanned as they enter the building? What role? What should my role be if my landlord turns away uh, an individual, uh, turns away an employee, 
is that um, because they have a fever. So I, I guess it's it's he really mixed two questions in the one. Um, but it was uh, if someone has a fever or someone has a they've identified, what is your role with sending them home? Is that within your within your control? Yeah. Um, so so one thing is, what do you want to do? You want to let your customers know that this is going on, just so they're not surprised. And I would probably tell your customer if you are if there is a problem, contact me. Um, yeah, maybe you go downstairs. We yeah, we have special signage designed for such a you know this displaying temperature screening ahead or and there's a lot of different signage that we have now too to go along with this. So right, which recommend. is great, which is great, and what you should do. But you know if you know you're going to have certain people come in. And again, this depends retail, you can't really do it. If it's my law firm, I can tell someone who's coming, hey, just so you know, we're gonna be taking your temperature um, when you come in. But what can you do about it? So the landlord has an obligation to have a safe environment there. So the landlord can do this. What you wanna find out from the landlord is what procedures are in place, what policies are in place, what the land, when, where the landlord's drawing the line um, for what's a temperature and what's not. And if someone comes in and they have a 104 temperature and there's no, you know, well, the guy says I was just running, um, you may, the landlord can probably almost certainly rightfully exclude that person from the building. Now, the person can call you and you may go on the street and talk to them and, you know, do your business there, but the landlord would have the right. You may have a separate issue where, you're having a mess, a guy on a messenger bike ride up to bring you something and they say, sorry, you can't come in the building. And the guy says, mm -hmm. well, of course I have a temperature. I was just riding, you know, in 95 degree heat. So I have a temperature, but I'm not sick. And that's going to become really a case by case scenario because these devices, remember, they're indicative of something. They're not determinative of anything. So they're going to be scenarios that, um, impact the effectiveness. So that's really a case by case issue. But if you know your landlord's doing it, I would want to find out today, you know, whatever today is before you're opening, I would want to contact the landlord and say, you know, what device are you using? Because you want to make sure to the extent you can, that it's something that's decent. You want to make sure they're not giving somebody a under the tongue thermometer and saying, that's what we're doing. Um, I would have a problem with that if my landlord was doing that. Um, and you want to find out when they're making a decision. And I would probably want to know from the landlord too, if my landlord's doing it. If you landlord are going to exclude somebody, I'm requiring you, I need you to contact me and tell me that. Like right at, the, at that point, because I may need to go down and talk to you, talk to them. I can't have you just turning away my customers. Yep. Um, are there any special requirements for schools or any different uh, school requirements on screening that, that are easier or harder than the regular business? Well, schools are going to deal with kind of two separate issues. And I'm talking about like high school and below where we're dealing with minors rather than college because yeah. that's kind of different. Is first, the right of privacy of students is much lower than the right of privacy of regular people. Schools have what I call kind of a, a parent obligation. That's why they can go into lockers, for example, if they suspect something at a much lower standard than that you as an employer could go into an employee's locker. Um, and their obligation to keep the place safe is slightly higher. So there's going to be less privacy protections with students in that respect. On the other hand, in terms of storing the data and using the data, they are dealing with minors. And it's always going to be touchier because to the extent there is consent, you can't get legal consent from minors. So while the school process, and I'm involved, I'm a, a volunteer coach at my schools, my high school's uh, track and cross country teams. So I'm kind of in that loop of what they're doing and planning. And I can tell you, they don't know yet. They, they want to do some type of temperature screening. I think a lot of schools, but they're not sure what to do about it, what temperature, how to deal with kids walking you know, to school. Some kids walk, some kids drive, hot days, cold days. Um, so it's developing, but the rights and obligations definitely are different. Um, my guess is they will have some sort of parental consent in advance 
here's what we're doing and we want you to consent to it. I'm not sure what they will end up doing if a parent says, I'm not consenting to you taking my kid's temperature. They may say, then your kid can't come to school. You know, you can do remote learning. I don't know. We'll be charting new territory, certainly. But I do believe that the CDC's recommendation is to take temperatures for kids at school. Oh, I just lost my connection for a second. All right, I'm going to end on that note here. I appreciate uh, all the information and um, and everything. If uh, anyone needs to get a hold of T equipment for a consultative uh, call, for an educational um, a call with members of your team, if you need pricing, um, any any of the above, if you want to schedule a consultation, you can scan this card. You can email. You can chat with us. You can call us. There's a lot of ways to get a hold of us. Kurt's information is right here. Um, if you need a policy procedure uh, or some consulting on uh, something in a greater level of detail, I suggest you reach out to him and um, schedule that as well. Um, appreciate everyone's time. A copy of this will go out to everyone. And um, thank you. I wish we had more time here, but uh, a lot, a lot of questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Evan. Take care.